My name's Lisa Sullivan and I'm the Senior Curator here at Geelong Gallery. Uh, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this Zoom session, a talking art event hosted by Geelong Contemporary. Uh, we are going to welcome very shortly two terrific artists that we've been working with at the gallery here uh, of Langish, Jill Orr and Sarah Walker, uh, who are both exhibiting uh, here at the gallery at the moment. And Sarah's there with one of her dogs. <laughs> my great aunt who's eating a very noisy ball. So I'd like, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that um, I'm this evening and the gallery is located on the lands of the Wadawurrung people and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging um, and I welcome uh, any First Nations people who have joined us on Zoom tonight. Um, we have one of the co-chairs of Geelong Contemporary, the support group that brings tonight's event to you. Uh, Amy Liu is here and I believe she's going to say a few, a few words. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, my, yes, my name's Amy Liu and uh, together with Sarah Scott, uh, we are the co-chairs of Geelong Contemporary. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of Geelong Contemporary uh, to our online event, which is held in conjunction with uh, the current exhibition, Exhume the Grave, McCubbin and Contemporary Art. So thank you to all of you for supporting us by joining this talk now. And I'll hand back over to you, Lisa. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. And on behalf of everyone here at the gallery, thank you to you and Sarah as co-chair and uh, the whole committee for all that you do in terms of supporting contemporary art, contemporary art here at the gallery. Um, the group has made some wonderful um, contributions to gallery life and also the collection in recent years. So thank you. So as I mentioned, tonight we welcome two artists, Jill Orr and Sarah Walker. Um, our third participant, Anza Helka, is unfortunately unable to um, join us tonight, but I can touch on uh, Anne's contribution to the Exhume the Grave exhibition on her behalf. Um, so Jill is an exhibitor in Exhume the Grave, and this is an exhibition that has been brought together as a complement, a pendant, I guess you could call it, to uh, Frederick McCubbin, Whisperings in Model Bows. And this is an exhibition that we open on the 4th of September here at the gallery. Uh, it is an exhibition that celebrates a major acquisition in the gallery's history, Frederick McCullum's The Bush Burial. So we're using this major acquisition, it's made in 1900, as the centre point to explore um, Frederick McCullum's interest in the bush over, over the 30-year um, uh, period of his practice. So we'll have 17 of his works on display very soon. Uh, and that will be a wonderful celebration in our 125th anniversary year. And as a complement to that exhibition, uh, I'm sitting at the moment in an exhibition that we just opened on Saturday, Exhume the Grave, McCubbin and Contemporary Art, which is uh, primarily a collection exhibition, but we've also brought some additional works in to, um, to share um, with the public uh, by six artists. Uh, the exhibition includes the work of six artists who are responding uh, to the work of McCubbin and interpreting his work through the different lenses of um, uh, feminism, uh, multiculturalism, First Nations and queer stories. Um, so it's a wonderful exhibition, which I hope we'll be able to have a look at very soon. Uh, and in fact, the exhibition title, uh, Exhume the Grave, takes uh, its lead from a very major work by Jill in the gallery's collection, a performance that we'll be exploring tonight in conversation. And we also welcome tonight Sarah Walker, who has been invited um, to be part of the gallery's wall commission series. So this is a series of four wall commissions that we've been rolling out this year, supported by Creative Victoria's COVID-19 Strategic Investment Fund with an, an imperative to really engage with our local artists. And indeed, Sarah is a local artist and she has responded to Frederick McCubbin's A Bush Burial as well uh, in a wonderful installation that again, we'll explore tonight. So I thought given that it's always such a privilege to hear from artists uh, without a doubt, um, I thought what we could do is go through this PowerPoint at the moment um, and perhaps open up to Jill to talk to us about the Exhume the Grave series, a performance that she um, uh, did in 1999 and which is represented in our collection through a series of five works that you see behind me, but also you'll see in this PowerPoint presentation. 
So Jill, as a starting point, could you talk to us about this, this, this performance, how it came about, uh, and what aspects of McCubbin's practice, his work, his life, that you were seeking to engage with through Exhume the Grave? Mm, thank you, Lisa. Um, First up, I um, live and work on Wurundjeri land and uh, I acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. This is unceded land and that's a very uh, powerful uh, beginning, particularly given McCubbin is a uh, colonial artist and sets, sets the scene really for um, a part of Australian identity. So it is only part of an Australian identity. Had, um, had I been able way back in creating Exhume the Grave, I might have been able to dig a little bit deeper and a bit broader in the acknowledgement of that. But um, it, it's a curious thing um, in, in uh, acknowledging Indigenous stories, but as a uh, middle-class white woman artist, um, the acknowledgement is what I can do best and support uh, and allow the other voices to speak. So my own voice within here, within Exhume the Grave, happened in a beautiful way because the gallery um, was in between directors and Anne Carew was like a, a temporary uh, director and she invited and commissioned me to make this uh, work. So I went to the gallery and I'd any, anyway already loved McCubbin's work. Um, I don't know, there's just some quality of his painting and he really can and does just get the quality of light from the Australian bush in such a unique and beautiful and impressionist way. So um, in seeing that painting was there, and of course, um, you know, the, all these incredible unstold, untold stories about it, um, I just dived in. So what I thought was, okay, um, given the mystery of, of who, uh, who is potentially buried there, and of course, I'll just leave it exactly buried there, and I'll just leave that hole empty just for a second, simply because... McCubbin did construct it. It's a performative construction. He constructed the entire grave in his um, home at Mount Macedon and um, just uh, kind of made it a performance in that sense, a painted performance. So I think, you know, he, he given I'm, I've practised performance, um, you know, forever, um, he, in fact, albeit probably not thinking of himself as a performance person, but indeed he created it. They were one of the first performances there and then. So for me, I thought, okay, then there are, there are some um, ghosts within this grave that I really wanted to exhume. And uh, so I thought, thought oh, yeah, McCubbin was also um, into the spiritualist church which basically channels um, um, presences from, from the other life. And I, I quite like that idea because in a sense, performance channels energies as well. So I thought, well, you know, if I start, start um, the whole excavation um, and the title of Exhume the Grave just came, came from that um, through the medium. And so the medium was like the um, 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 master of ceremonies in a way, although nobody spoke, it was a purely visual thing. Um, so I had these five characters and I imagined, well, you know, it could, it could have so easily been a mother or a child who'd who, who, who had passed away. Um, it probably, everyone had to work to the bone there. They were really always very poor it could have been a worker. Now, whether the worker was working in the paddocks or whether um, um, she was, um, you know, serving a more wealthy person, I don't know, but I thought the worker. And I chose sort of characters that could be really easily identifiable. Uh, uh, so the mother, the worker, Opium Lil, well, of course, 
Ballarat and Bendigo and all the gold fields aren't that far away. So it was not inconceivable that it could have been uh, a reference to uh, some of the, the underrepresented Chinese um, uh, workers. I thought Opium Lil was kind of an interesting out there title that um, uh, kind of had to be represented. So what have we got? Medium, da, 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 there's one more. Oh, the bride. Oh, yes. The bride to be or not to be was the other one. So there she, in, in a sense, has she been, has she been left because uh, her partner passed away or um, really that was the story. So that's the overt story. They're, they're the basic images. But what really happened, see, in performance art, there's this whole dialogue that you had to be there. And in this performance in particular, you sort of did. Because the photographic uh, images, albeit they are of the performance and they are, you know, very representative of the physical thing that happened, um, what was really going on was I had made for each character a very simple um, painting, a backdrop to each of them. And with the backdrop, I'd used intensely uh, sensitive, uh, light sensitive pigment, which meant that, and these, these backdrops were pretty plain, and, uh, but it meant, and this all happened as a really crazy experiment in my studio, I thought, oh my God. <laughs> okay, so here, this is what actually happens is that, <coughs> excuse me, you charge a light onto this light sensitive pigment, for these characters, I, I performed a very simple action, froze for, well, I don't know, I needed at least a minute, so I really froze for a minute. Meanwhile, this light charges and creates the most sensitive and articulate shadow and bang, the lights go off. I disappear and the shadow remains. So therein the ghost is there, the ghost is present. And very gradually the um, uh, shadow fades away. And uh, anyway, this, this pigment they use as a um, safety pigment in airports and places in mines. So that, that, that it's, gotta be, it's gotta be really working for hours and hours and hours. Well, I, I didn't need the performance to actually to last that long. So with another refresher of light, um, you know, it disappears, but each one had their own uh, impression. So then in, ter in terms of so um, the photographers, I, I, I needed to do it live. I needed to do this particular work live. Sometimes I just do performances for the camera because it just, you know, cuts out the middle people really. And you can, I can just go straight for the image. But this one, I needed to have that kind of feeling of, oh my God, look at this, look at this. And so these hovering presences were still present within the gallery. So I think, I think um, just getting back to McCubbin's painting, you know, a painting has its presence as well. You know, as there's this powerful sense of, it emits more than it actually is. So there's, you know, people kind of sit in front of it and can be drawn right into it. And, and, and that's the function of painting, really. You, you sit with it, you let it become, and you become it to allow it to speak to you. Whereas um, I get, you know, in, in, in performance, really they have to take it away in their memory. Admittedly, I take the Cubbins painting away in my memory too. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're a bit on the same page there. Um, that's, a, that's a good point, Jill. And, and just coming back to the painting as well, your interest in McCubbin's interest in spiritualism, which was very popular in the late 19th century. Mm. And it's said that the, um, do you want to talk a little bit about the veil, yeah. the cloth that's on the cart? Yes, indeed, indeed. Well, the cloth, according to the research I had done, but it makes sense uh, in these terms, is it's like a veil, a veil to the other side. I guess it's it's a similar, has a similar function to smoke. You know, the smoke can kind of be that um, molecule, molecular veil between one one uh, reality and another. Well, the veil in that sense um, evokes that. 
And I certainly did that in the costumes and uh, allowed the veils to, um, you know, perform. <laughs> yeah. Jill, you're one of Australia's most well-known performance artists. And um, I'm, I mean, the way that you've described um, this performance is spectacular. This notion of the the, the light, the, the light sensitive paint, the the way that you've conjured literally the spirit is quite incredible. I I, I do wish I was there to be honest. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this, that would have been nice. This, this notion of light acts as a really interesting segue to bring Sarah into the conversation because Perfect. of course performance. Uh, I mean, Sarah's work is very performative as well, and, and it reads very much as a script, essentially. Um, but light is a very important part of your work as well, Sarah. And let's scroll through, and you'll, we'll perhaps come back to this uh, additional work of yours, The Promised Land, in a moment. Yeah, no problem. Sarah, could I, could I perhaps hand over to you to talk <laughs> to us about this particular work, how the commission came about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how you were tapping into McCubbin's work, it literally, you know, two decades after Jill's um, mm. work, of course, but this is a very current work. Uh, it was commissioned by the gallery this year uh, during uh, COVID lockdowns. Mm -hmm. So please, could you share with us your thoughts on this work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as Lisa says, uh, the, the gallery contacted me and asked um, whether I would be interested in taking on one of the wall commissions and gave me this enormous wall um, and said, would you be interested in responding to, to a bush burial? Um, and like a lot of Australians, I grew up with McCubbin prints on the wall, really old, faded, kind of sun damaged prints. We had the Pioneer series up over the fireplace and I'm pretty sure we had a couple of the placemats as well. Like he's, <laughs> he's just a kind of central to the way that um, people of my parents' generation especially conceptualised the narrative that is Australia. Um, and so I was very familiar with the painting and uh, I, I think um, like this mystery about who is buried in the grave is, is something that was kind of of interest to, to both Jill and to me. Um, and I, I was fascinated by the fact that the woman in the painting, the grieving woman, is uh, the model for that woman is McCubbin's wife, Annie, who modelled for him extensively throughout his career. Um, at the time of the painting, they'd been together I think they'd been married for maybe two or three years. Uh, and I was fascinated by this relationship that they might have had and the and this performativity of him painting this image where, as Jill says, he <laughs> built a grave in his backyard, got his wife to stand out there um, and, and painted her. And I was kind of fascinated by wondering about that experience as a performance. And so I created this script between the two of them. Um, where they're kind of communicating, uh, he, sort of joking with each other, laughing. He's telling her to stand still. She's kind of like ribbing him a bit for how long this always takes. Um, and then in the text, there are these gaps. Um, and when you uh, run a UV torch over those gaps, more text emerges, um, which is in UV ink. It's totally invisible when you're not looking for it. Uh, and that UV ink um, was how I imagined Annie's inner monologue, uh, because we know so much about Frederick and we know so little about Annie. We, we know that they had a great relationship. We know pretty much nothing else about her, um, except that they had quite a lot of children. And um, I was really interested by the fact that his, his wife is standing there and she's modelling with this child. She's modelling for grief. And then two or three years after this painting was completed, uh, their child, Mary, who was three years old, fell out of her stroller, hit her head on cobblestones and died, which is just the most staggeringly devastating thing you can possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. And there was something about this kind of echo of experience of, of her modelling for a grief that hadn't yet arrived. And so I kind of imagined across the course of this afternoon where she's modelling for him that she starts having this kind of vision of this future which hasn't yet occurred. So in this invisible text, she's starting to have these strange images arriving of this child, which then uh, slowly balloons out into this enormous kind of cataclysm of, of text um, where she's she's remembering, she's remembering a future that hasn't yet happened of, of attending the, the death of her child, which finally the ink becomes so um, heavy that it, that it just drips down the wall. 
Uh, and then the vision kind of ends and Frederick says to her, I've finished the painting. Oh, your, your expression was perfect. What were you thinking? And she says, oh, nothing, nothing at all. Mm -hmm. um, there's something about the kind of like the, the idea of her interiority and um, kind of imagining this very deep inner life that we know so little of through um, the archive and through the paintings that he made of her, kind of allowing her to have this very 3D experience um, when we know her only as a 2D painting, I found really interesting. Mm, absolutely. And I think that sort of conceptual use of light is, is really interesting, the way um, you invite uh, audiences to engage with the work, you invite audiences to activate the work, yeah. the subtlety of that and the way that it's almost this, this, as you say, this internal monologue, this, this undercurrent of grief and, and, and things going on in Annie's mind mm. that um, uh, only come out as the torch comes out to, to illuminate. Yeah. And I'm so thrilled that, like, Jill, I didn't know in your performance this, this kind of this, these shadows which then disappear, <laughs> this kind of um, inaccessible uh, experience of light. It feels like it has this lovely kind of... Um, resonance with the with with this work because uh yeah once once you move the torch away it vanishes and you can't you can't hold it it's inherently fleeting and ephemeral um yeah that that's such a lovely resonance there which I'm very excited to to know about <laughs> so am I for you too yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'd love to be able to come and see it <laughs> hopefully hopefully yeah, yeah. <laughs> let you out yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. we've, got, we've got some uh, some great documentation on the website and indeed a wonderful interview with you, Sarah, um, you know, talking about the work and, and the, the areas of interest for you. And they are very much around these ideas of death, catastrophe, disaster and dark humour. Can you talk a little bit about how you use that, that idea of humour? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I'm very interested in uh, how many things in our experience of the world, we're, re we're really socialised to not speak about and to struggle to talk about, um, especially when it comes to death and disaster. And we're all, I mean, especially now living in this state of um, feeling like it is impossible to prepare for things going wrong. I definitely have felt that kind of lingering, overwhelming anxiety. Uh, I mean, my whole life, but, um, <laughs> but especially over the last two years. Uh, but I'm also interested in, in ways that we can unpack and allow conversations to happen about those things, because the most terrifying thing is shame and fear. And um, I'm really interested in, in the way that comedy, bring it allows people space and generosity to come into a conversation, into to a notion, so that if you say to someone, hey, do you want to talk about the death of a child? People are like, absolutely not. But if you're like, hey, uh, we're fun, we're having fun, we're having a really fun time. And now we're talking about death of a child and you're with me because, because I've, I've, you know, like given you a hand um, and, and proof that it, it doesn't have to be frightening. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm constantly interested in the way that mm. comedy is a very powerful tactic for, for unpacking um, fear and anxiety and, and grief, um, yeah, which kind of works across all of the, the media that I work in. But, um, yeah, I love, I love how generous humour can be and how it can allow dark things to to sit with us without crushing us. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and these these paintings by McCubbin, these these paintings that have been described as these national narrative paintings, things like the bush burial, down on his luck, mm. on the wallaby track, the pioneer. Mm. Um, you touched on earlier, Jill, they are but one side of a story and, and you know, they represented nationalism, uh, in the late nine, uh, late nine, 1800s, early 1900s, when we think about what was happening in Australia, um, you know, there was um, a particular settler story that was um, shared. Uh, there were celebrations around colonial settlement, like the Victorian Jubilee in the 1880s. The country was moving towards federation. So there were particular stories. But I think what's um, powerful about Exhume the Grave and the work of yourself and other artists in this exhibition, such as Juan de Villa, mm. Adza Holker, Christian Thompson, Robert Haig, and Poloxeni Pepepetru, is that there are opportunities to hear that there are other stories, other narratives mm. um, within, within the, the, the national story. And I might just touch on very briefly to share with our audiences some works by Adza Helker, who was unable to, um, to join us tonight, but which I think may 
provide a segue, Jill, into your The Promised Land still. Um, so Anne is a, um, a Sydney-based artist, uh, and for many years she's been working on these postmodernist appropriations of McCubbin's works and, and other major artists. So in this work here, of course, we see her using as her framework McCubbin's The Pioneer of 1904, a very famous work uh, which tells this sort of colonial settler story and the, the, the idea of settling the land, uh, making it your home, uh, and then you know the burgeoning city uh, in the right-hand panel on the, in the distance, but the the, um, the the young boy, possibly the the, the child of the, the pioneer couple um, who returns to the gravesite to um, you know mourn their loss, etc. But it shows that sort of narrative that runs through. And so Anne's um, postmodernist interpretations of these works is to implant her own family story into the narrative. Uh, she was the child of uh, migrants who arrived in Australia in the 1950s, post World War II migrants. Uh, and she spent a lot of her, her, her youth growing up wondering where did her family story fit into the Australian narrative? Mm -hmm. So in this work here, we see her transplant aspects of her family narrative over the pioneer. So in the central panel, the smash repairs replaces the cottage in McCubbin's work, and it is her father's business. And indeed, it's Anne in the pram uh, and her family members that are collaged onto a reproductive poster of McCubbin's work. This is all pre-digital in 1983. And then in the right-hand panel, it's the Zahelka family memorial in Europe. Uh, and it's this idea of, um, you know, the, the, the connections that you have to your homeland, but the connections and, and stories that you create in uh, in Australia as well. And the year of this work, 1983, was the year that Anne's father passed away. And this is a work uh, in which um, she sort of honours his memory um, as the first of the Sahelka clan to have been buried in Australian soil. Mm -hmm. And then another major work by Anne, the pioneer, 1992, which takes the central panel, which we'll look at in a moment, and it uh, erases a key element of this very well-known central panel of McCubbin's triptych. And it basically is a feminist statement saying that uh, the man is erased from the narrative uh, and it refocuses our gaze on the fact that women played such an important role in settling the country. And so if we look at the original painting, um, I'm, I'm sure you'll all see the, the correlations and connections. Um, but it's this idea of the migrant story um, that both uh, Anne explores and also Juan de Villa through his versions of a bush burial, which are also in this exhibition. But I wondered if I could go back, Jill, to your work that's also in this exhibition. So your 1999 uh, Exhume the Grave work. So I was also very interested to connect with you and see what you've been doing in more recent years, of course. And we've been very privileged to be able to loan from you uh, a work from the Promised Land series. So I wonder if I scroll back to that work, if you wouldn't mind <laughs> chatting to us about this series. This is but one still, uh, one photograph within a, a more comprehensive series, but I'd love to hear about um, this series. Sure. Uh, well, the Promised Land is exactly um, that immigrant story. Um, I made this, um, you know, when uh, uh, our federal government, being such a, a generous um, body, basically said, if you arrive on a boat, you're going to be stuck in detention for, you know, probably ever. Mm -hmm. And um, we still don't know. There's still people there. So, in fact, it is an ongoing story. It's just other things have got, uh, have overlaid it a bit lately. So, um, the boat that I... Matt, well, I didn't make it, I, did, I designed it, and then we got some amazing, went through an architect's drawing, and then it went through a joiner. So what it is is, you know, like those early dinosaurs and those sort of little um, plywood creatures that you can slot together? Well, that's how this boat works. You just slot it together. But it really doesn't float, obviously. So I started, um, started the series, actually, um, at um, just pre-dawn at uh, where the spirit of, ta of Tasmania on St Kilda Beach arrived. So there's, we did it there, then a little bit further on the beach. Then it went to where the, all the immigrants come, uh, came for years and years and years um, by a station pier 
So that was a real immigrant story, a real site where thousands and thousands of people would have come by boat, but um, they were accepted, particularly post-war immigrants. Um, so they all arrived there. And then I took the boat. I had a tiny little crew of people because it was really hard. I couldn't do it by myself. Christina Simons was the photographer, so she and I worked really closely just to snap it. Um, but this is actually by the Yarra River, and it is exactly the place where McCubbin and the other uh, Heidelberg uh, school painters actually painted. Mm -hmm. And when I went, which was not conscious at the time, but as soon as I saw the image, it just evoked McCubbin. Like, uh, particularly when you, it may be not so visible on a screen, but when you see the, see the photograph real, it's just there are qualities that McCubbin gets in his painting that are actually um, imminent and uh, uh, seen and felt within this landscape. And so um, that's why I was really thrilled that um, this could be still part of the exhibition because McCubbin's um, country albeit being on Wurundjeri country, but the country he's recorded for us in paint is exactly that area. It is kind of where I live. It's just like, oh, my goodness, this is beautiful. So it's personal, actually. It's sort of um, that's the story. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think what really comes out through the selection of works for Whisperings in Model Bows, um, it's, it's, it's going to be a very sort of... Um, um, uh, sort of focused exhibition, I guess, that looks specifically at McCubbin's interest in the bush. And the thread that I've teased out through some of the selections is very much this idea of the places and the people that he engaged with. Um, he was an artist whose life was lived virtually entirely in Melbourne, um, 1855 to 1917. He did visit Europe once in 1907 for about six months. But locale, um, you know, the, 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 that where he lived in Bourne, where he lived in Hawthorne, where he, where he painted with uh, Tom Roberts and Louis Abrahams uh, mm -hmm. in the Box Hill region or Studley Park Q, um, mm -hmm. the property that he and his family lived in, Fontainebleau in the Mount Macedon region. He mm -hmm. connected with the local landscape and mm -hmm. it's exactly what you're doing as well. And he also utilise the people in his life as his models, as is, is not unusual for artists, of course, to do that. But there's this wonderful thread that goes through the exhibition that we'll share with you from the 4th of September that really explores and navigates those aspects of his practice. Yeah, that's really nice to hear you say that, Lisa, because it is about, it, ultimately, it is about the land. Um, it was great to hear Sarah's story about humour. And as she was speaking, I thought, my goodness, of course, laughter ha, 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 is an exhale. Mm. So you sort of automatically have to have to release tension. Ah, mm. You know, so, so the very function of laughter is that. But then when you when we, when we come back to McCubbin, it's about the place. It's, it, it is where where, um, you know, the idea of fly in and fly out, fly mm. in, make a work and fly out again. For some reason, I don't know. I, I find that I find that very difficult to do myself. I, I can't find a depth that's kind of got any serious meaning. Whereas, if it comes from the place, the land that I have attachment to, I don't have to own it, but just I have attachment to it. Um, it just kind of makes a more powerful um, reason to be. And so I also then one more thing and then I'll be quiet, but <laughs> the idea that for all, um, all immigrants here in a way also have to find their journey in order to relate to this place, like how can we be here? And I think a lot of the answer to that, given it's not, an, we, we're not in, or, you know, immigrants aren't Indigenous by the very nature of being immigrants, is that by claiming and understanding your own story, you have a story to tell because it's like, you know, white um, colonial folk don't have a story. But that's actually quite incorrect. 
it's just that we don't we, we we don't look back on our own individual stories to kind of claim it mm. I'm sure there's some pretty ghastly things that we've all done or my family has we're missionaries and gold miners I mean really we're we're wreckers absolute <laughs> wreckers but you know I mean once I've found and made work from that it kind of um has released the story for me so I know yeah, and, and that's a really interesting point Jill because in in researching the um the catalogue for um uh Whisperings on Model Bars. I was thinking very much about this idea of McCubbin himself. He was mm -hmm. the first born generation of his family. His parents were immigrants from, from um, Britain. Uh, and so his, his, his family arrived with their own settler story. Uh, they settled in uh, King Street in the city and his life was very much in the, the, the domain or the grid of, of, of Melbourne as a city. But I often think about this idea of his engagement with the bush that was encouraged by Tom Roberts, for example. And uh, it was Tom Roberts that first took him across to Studley Park in Kew and also um, encouraged and invited him to paint in Box Hill. And this idea that McCubbin may have been wishing to implant his own stories on the Australian landscape to define himself from the stories that he grew up with, which were all about the old country mm. uh, and, and wanting to sort of just make his mark on the Australian landscape, which he, which he very much did. And we think, and I guess perhaps the next question to both of you is um, before I perhaps um, also encourage uh, any attendees to put a question into the Q&A or the chat function, which I can read out for, for Jill and Sarah. But this idea of, you know, your thoughts around, you know, what is McCubbin's legacy um, for, for both of you? Um, Sarah, you've already talked about this idea of growing up with memorabilia mm -hmm. of McCubbin, which I did as well. I grew up with some ceramic plates uh, that uh, mm -hmm. had the bush burial and lost <laughs> and, and other of McCubbin's works up on my mum's um, bookshelf. But um, what do you feel his legacy and significance is, is now as an artist? It's interesting. There's, um, there's a quality to his work, which I think really speaks of um, the settler relationship with this land, which is that there's always even he's so clearly kind of awed by the landscape and, and truly loves it. And there's, but there's always this kind of little thread of menace underneath it. Uh, the idea that the, the landscape is maybe not fully to be trusted and that the effort of taming it is, is, is deep and profound and ultimately kind of worthwhile. Um, and I think we still really carry this slight suspicion of the, of the <laughs> land. And I mean, I, you know, I grew up in very much a, a suburban environment. And when, when you put me out in the, in the Australian bush, I feel unsettled there. <laughs> the, the the unsettled settler that should be the title or something. <laughs> yes. um, but uh yeah and I, I I think there's something about there's such grand narratives and I think they're they're so fundamental to a lot of our cultural relationship with the place that we occupy and I yeah I think there's something really interesting about this man who you know spent so much time on country um and still to had just there's this tiny suspicion, I think, to his his view of, of the landscape. And I think we we carry that still. And that and that menace comes out in works, for example, like Lost. Yeah. Um, of 1886, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the in the Box Hill area. And also, of course, there's a, a later 1907 version, but we've secured Lost 1886 of the exhibition, which is incredibly exciting to have such a major uh, work from his collection. But, but Jill, did you want to pipe in there with um, your thoughts on on McCubbin's legacy and his his significance today? Well, I, th I think that I kind of agree with Sarah about that underlying menace, but I, I think that was part of its time because mm. we didn't, or there weren't any. Um, for example, I don't, fairly I, only a few years ago, uh, Fred Cahiers put out a book that. Um, uh, has direct quotes from the first settlers getting off boats. And they, um, their words are things like, I walk, walked up the hill, I walked across the sands, I walked up the hill on a funny little track and I came out and, oh, my God, there was a valley that was clear, it was pristine. It's as if I was in the botanical gardens. Mm -hmm. Now, that was Indigenous country. They were, they were describing and, and then a, a lot of the other stories are 
ones we probably know a lot more like um you know i was starving and they 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 they, they saved my life basically mm-hmm. that that's that's actually what happened to heaps of them so i think mccubbin perhaps didn't as didn't have access to those stories mm. or whether, whether it was it was culturally not um, um, even thought about probably I don't know I actually don't know but I imagine it wasn't a broad conversation as it is now and so therefore that little doubt that little unknowing maybe that little guilt I don't know m- maybe contributes to that um, unease mm-hmm. Mm, Absolutely. Mm. Now, Jill, I'm very happy to report uh, that we have an attendee tonight that was at your performance. Really? uh, Has said said that it was spectacular. Um, (laughs) I don't doubt it for a minute. But um, obviously, um, if there's any questions from the audience, (laughs) now's the moment to to send them through. But also, Jill and Sarah, I wonder if you have questions of one another. Wow. (laughs) Let's talk about putting you on the spot. Yeah. I want to know what the last 18 months have been like for you, Jill, because your work is so collaborative and so performative. Like, what have you been, has, has this time freed up space for new kind of entry points into your work or are you just finding it really kind of well, dash? <laughs> um, I did a, a new body of work that was for the um, Monash University Gallery um, Museum, sorry, you know, MoMA. Yeah. And uh, they commissioned to do it and I had to wait for lockdown to finish. I knew exactly it's been an image that has been in me for ages and it was really uh, this tree that's not far away from where I live but it's been ruthlessly chopped off and it's Mm. kind of been this massive tree. It was a mother Mm. of a tree put under a freeway bridge and I've walked past it a million times I've seen it it looked I knew at dawn it would be this powerful silhouette and so I Mm. had to wait to do this performance with it um for a brief moment and and it just unlocked enough for me to do it get the work processed done printed framed off to Monash and um I, I do um teach uh, at, at Ballarat, Wadaran mm-hmm. Country in Ballarat, mm-hmm. at the art school there, the performance and uh, visual arts school at the Federation University. Mm-hmm. And so really mo- most of my time has been um, trying to not get too stressed about how to teach practical things on yeah. Zoom. Yeah. Like, it's, changed, it's like it's mad. Mm-hmm. So uh, last, I've got a big class on tomorrow, but last week, it was the first time I've seen them for ages and I thought, you know, all, all back online again, I thought, well, I just think I'll pretend to be Nigella Lawson <laughs> and uh, <laughs> create this thing and then they can kind of respond from there. So that's what happened. <laughs> it's, uh, it's weird. It's really weird. Mm. And you, Sarah? Yeah, it's been a um, the kind of my bread and butter c- cash work um, comes from uh, I'm a theatre photographer so oh, I well you yeah it's been Crazy. quiet I'm telling you it's been quiet <laughs> um, but uh yeah I was I was lucky enough to um be offered the opportunity to write a book last year which has uh just come out oh that would um, have been perfect yeah oh it was great yeah I I was in this kind of just like chaos of, of lockdown we just moved to Geelong we didn't know anyone my mum had just died everything was terrible oh no um, oh yeah it was trash do not recommend Awful. uh but yeah so then I, I'd spend like 18 hours a day just wandering about the house like some sort of like Edwardian ghost and then I'd sit down and be like okay but I have to write this book so that was good hello <laughs> Well, I, I was going to mention your book, actually, Sarah, and I have the details here. It is called The First Time I Thought I Was Dying. And, and it's, wow. it's, it's very, very nice to be able to say that um, not only has Sarah published a book, but it has been the winner of the University of Queensland Press Quentin Bryce Award. Oh, fantastic. She wrote me the nicest letter. She's got very nice handwriting. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Oh, hello. This is my, this is my dog. This can just hang oh. <laughs> uh, All right. You'll get fed. I'm busy. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, great. It's a collection of essays kind of about um, the relationship between uh, the body and 
kind of our environment which tries to keep our, our bodies and minds under control at all times and our bodies and minds are like absolutely not so um <laughs> there's writing in there about I oh, thank you uh there's writing in there about um sex and art and theater and uh death and anxiety and all sorts of things so um yeah available at all good bookstores <laughs> I think I think there's uh, we've unraveled quite a lot of synergies between the two of you tonight and I think <laughs> this um given Jill is is one of Australia's most highly regarded performance artist and therefore your body has been central to your practice yeah. Uh, yeah. Jill. So, yeah. There's a lot of signatures. I have one question that's come through, and it's from Mum Anne Steele, who also congratulates you, Sarah, on your Quentin Bryce Award. Thanks, but Anne's, <laughs> Anne's asked the question: Will She Oaks exhibition come to Geelong Gallery? And of course, this is the National Gallery of Victoria She Oaks and Sunlight exhibition, mm -hmm. uh, Australian Impressionism, which sadly has been curtailed by COVID nineteen um, with Melbourne lockdowns. Um, and no, the exhibition won't come to Geelong Gallery. But indeed, we are getting some major loans from that exhibition. So um, not only will our bush burial return to, um, to the Geelong Gallery, but also from that exhibition we'll have ex uh, works including uh, Down on His Luck, The Pioneer, mm -hmm. Lost, Tom Roberts' The Artist Cam, um, wow. so, um, also at the falling of the year from the National Gallery of Australia. So um, although it won't be the full complement of that exhibition, we have lined up some really terrific lines for the Geelong um, Gallery um, exhibition. And Anne is responding with a very excited, fantastic, which is, <laughs> we're excited too, Anne. Mm. So um, there are possibly some other questions that have come through. Uh, that opens on the 4th of September. It opens on the 4th, Saturday the 4th of wow. September. And Sarah's exhibition runs through until the 17th of October, her small white hands uh, as part of our commission uh, program. Uh, and it's in the grave runs through to the 28th of November, as does Whisperings and Waddle Bows. And I went and saw it's in the grave today and it was fantastic. I was so delighted by it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and there is also a message here too saying that we really do hope Jill, you're able to come down and see Exhume the Grave because it's been such a pleasure to work with you on the project as it has with you as well, Sarah. Um, and uh, it's been a great privilege to have you both here tonight to chat with us in dialogue, um, to share with our um, audiences who are very interested in contemporary art and you are both um, great contemporary artists. So I think I'm going to take that opportunity to, to, to wrap up. I think we've come to the end of our allocated time tonight. Um, but thank you um, very much. We've got some messages coming through from, from Fit Murray just to say thank you for the great conversation and, <laughs> and we really do hope wherever you are in Victoria or even uh, beyond Victoria that you're able to pop down to Chanon Gallery um, within that, that, that range of the exhibitions. So Jill and Sarah, thank you very much for being wonderful exhibitors in Chanon Gallery. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. And for being fantastic participants in tonight's conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Good so luck much. with the uh, the finishing touches and whisperings in Waddle Bow. Yeah. Thank you. I'll thank wait you. to see it all. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, thank you to everyone that's been a, uh, uh, an attendee tonight. It's great to have your support, and we look forward to welcoming you back to the gallery. We are open at the moment, of course, as a regional gallery, uh, and welcoming regional visitors uh, under our COVID nineteen safety plan. So um, we hope you can join us. Thanks very much. Good night.